Every summer, millions of vacationing families head for freshwater lakes and rivers to cool off and have fun. But they are not alone. Their splashing and laughing has attracted attention from a toothy monster laying in wait. Next thing I know, wham! I just got hit and it was, it was full force. It was very hungry and it, it, it took a chance on something it saw dangling in the water. About like 20,000 needles sticking in both sides of your hand. We caught some huge ones as big as about the bow of the basketball. Are these stories fact or fiction? Monster Quest will travel the world looking for proof. Gauging the danger to humans. Using science to unlock the mystery on how big these creatures get. We begin in the Amazon River. The target, a monster catfish. Catfish have no scales. Their bodies are either naked or covered in bony plates. They have up to four pairs of barbels, used mostly for detecting food, but in some species can deliver a poison strong enough to hospitalize a human. And if stories are to be believed, these giants are big enough to swallow small children whole. Well, the big ones can take a small kid. They'll be swimming in the water, they're like, and they can go deeper like this, and they dive under and the catfish will get them. The dark, murky waters of the Amazon hide many dangerous creatures, like piranha, caimans, and snakes. It is also home to the giant red-tailed catfish. The record caught on rod and reel was 54 inches long and almost 108 pounds. But locals say they catch them much bigger. But this big is bigger than him I that, that he's caught here. Native Amazonians claim to regularly catch 50-pound catfish and occasionally hook monster cats over six feet long and 200 to 300 pounds. Mike Nee and Brian Coe are Colorado sports fishermen on a Monster Quest dream fishing trip. Their goal? To catch one of these specimens. Ever since I was a little kid, I've always wanted to come see the Amazon River. They will be joined by local fishing guide, Mark Kobos, who has been guiding sport fishermen in these waters for over 20 years. This is dangerous out here. If you're not careful, you know, it can be dangerous out here. According to Kobos, the many twists and turns of the river create deep pools where the big cats are said to hide, much the way they have for many centuries. Mm. In January of 1500, Spanish explorer Vicente Yanis Pinzon first landed on what is now the coast of Brazil. He also discovered the estuary of the Amazon River. He called it Rio Santa Maria de la Maldulce. For 350 years after, the area remained a wilderness inhabited mostly by indigenous people until 1850 when steamboat navigation began to open up the Amazon. It is still remote enough that big fish stories don't reach the outside world. People get up and down here by the river taxis, and that's, that's the roads, the waterways. This lodge will serve as the base camp for the giant catfish expedition. It's located in the heart of territory prowled by catfish and other record-breaking giants. We chose this area because after, after fishing all around the Amazon, this was the area that produced the most trophy-sized peacock bass, and it's 20 minutes from where the world record was caught. Mike Messina is the only biologist from North America currently working in this area okay, to study this here. beautiful game fish. Fish is four pounds, six ounces. About three years ago, we started a large tagging program. We weigh and measure the fish. Uh, they're caught hook and line. We go ahead and we put a tag in the fish, get a GPS uh, uh, coordinate so we know the latitude and longitude and let the fish go. And the idea of this particular program here is to try and recapture the fish, determine the growth rates and the movement of the fish. 
Although Messina's work primarily concentrates on the peacock bass, 49. he's well aware of the catfish that roam this river. There are a lot of big fish down here. There's some very large catfish and other types of Amazonian natives, uh, native fish that, that grow very, very rapidly. For generations, people living along the shores of the Amazon have told stories of giant catfish slurping up their children. And to this day, the deep, dark pools where these giants are said to live are avoided. I've heard stories of uh, catfish you know, wash up on the beach and you see the feet st sticking out of his mouth. It's a small child you know, that will even catch. This woman says it happened to one of her family. Mm. That, back then, the, the parents didn't let the kids and children play too much in the river because the river they had a lot of, lot of catfish, big catfish. And they call it the fera, which is like a beast. During the mid-1970s, a local boy was attacked here on the Rio Negro River, where Ni and Kobos are searching for giant cats. Yeah, he was five years old. The young boy was Celestina Valena's cousin, and she remembers the tragic story like it was yesterday. Fishing guide Mark Kobos translates. Okay, during the season when the, when the river goes down, okay, and all the schools of fish come out of the lagoons into the main river. Okay, the, all, the, all the guys in the, in the village brought the fish. Her cousin and another young boy followed the men to the lagoon in their own tiny canoe. Suddenly, their canoe was struck with a violent thud. A catfish jumped out of the water, hit the canoe, and the boy fell in the water. So everybody, you know, dived in and, and tried to find him. And, yeah, but they, they couldn't find them. They searched all afternoon. After a week, they have reports that they have found the piraiba, the red-tailed catfish, with a small child in, in it, and it was dead on the, on the shore. The catfish was said to be about a foot larger than a man, or about six and a half feet long. The catfish apparently choked on the 60-pound boy. Catfish are considered indiscriminate feeders, eating crayfish and mussels off the bottom and minnows and fish near the surface. They have also been known to eat small ducks and muskrats. They are known to grab onto just about anything that comes into range, a fact that has cultivated a dangerous sport where man is the intended bait. Newman's are to catching catfish with your hands. I mean, with your bare necessities. Lee McFarland is a well-known noodler from Stillwater, Oklahoma. Different places, it's different names. It's grappling, it's hogging, it's uh, stumping. Well, the only reason we've always called it noodling is because trying to get all that fish like grabbing a wet noodle. To me, I've been doing it with my hands ever since I was a kid. I'd rather do this than catch with a rod and reel any time. Not everybody does it, and everybody thinks you're crazy if you do, but... McFarland targets flathead catfish, which can be up to five feet long and weigh over 120 pounds. Basically, you just find rocks and water and just start walking around them until you find holes underneath them. Just got to block all the holes off and reach in there and see what's in there. Try to get them by the bottom lip, and once you get that bottom lip with one hand, you try to put your thumb in the corners of the mouth over to the sides, and you take your fingers through the gills on each side. As soon as you get a hold of them gills and you bring him out, you try to put that tail between your leg and wrap your legs around that tail to control the tail. If you don't control that tail, you don't control the fish. Experienced noodlers take a physical beating. Their hands and fingers sometimes look like they went through a meat grinder. It's like taking two wire brushes and smashing your hand between it and jerking your hand out. Like 20,000 needles sticking in both sides of your hand. <laughs> but it is also very dangerous as McFarland experienced firsthand. He ain't worth dying for. I don't care how small or how big he is, there ain't no fish worth dying for. The catfish of the Amazon and Oklahoma are big, but nowhere near the size of the catfish found in Asia. So the largest freshwater fish that we found was last year, and it was nine feet in length and 646 pounds. 
According to researcher Dekalia Chernyuka from the World Wildlife Fund, the largest catfish are found in the Mekong Delta of Cambodia. The Mekong giant catfish is found in the lower part of the Mekong River, which starts out in Tibet and ends in Vietnam in the South China Sea. There is a long tradition of fishing for giant catfish. Cave paintings dating back over 1,000 years reveal how the Mekong people believed it's a sacred fish because it lives on plant matter and meditates in deep pools of the Mekong River, described as somewhat like a Buddhist monk. This Mekong cat is nearly five times heavier than the largest catfish in the United States. However, the catfish Lee McFarland hunts are far more aggressive. Oh, you couldn't wipe a smile off with 12 undertakers after you get one over 50 pounds. Noodlers target this behavior by fishing with their bare hands under river banks and submerged trees. A dangerous sport, most taken stride. Oh, oh yeah. Right. That's not bad. <laughs> yeah, they'll be about the same size. I think it's not a bad start to today. Ow! <laughs> hey, he's strung up and he's biting. That ain't fair. But not all days end this way. In 2002, at Lake Carl Blackwell in Oklahoma, McFarland met his match. I was down there and I worked in this fish and I'm working him and he finally comes up and I get a hold of the fish and he gets a hold of me and I start to pull him out and he jerks me back against the rock and bangs me up. I pull him back up and I was trying to wrap my legs around him, trying to stream, trying to do everything I could down there. And as I finally come out and couldn't get a hold of him, he just started spinning with me. Had me all twisted up. <laughs> McFarland estimates the catfish was over 100 pounds, a sizable foe for even the strongest man. He started spinning, I just couldn't hold him. He ain't worth dying for. I don't care how small or how big he is, there ain't no fish worth dying for. And that's what you always got to remember. You can always let go. McFarland's 100-pound attacker is just a runt compared to the monster catfish of the Amazon, where Mike Nee and Brian Coe's hunt is underway. Mark Kobos will guide the team to spots where big cats are often caught. But first, they must catch the bait, piranhas and barracuda. You got a piranha? See? Around the corner? Yes, it is, my lagoon. In the, the lagoon? lagoon? Yeah. Okay. And we'll troll? Yes. Okay. With bait in hand, the hunt for a monster catfish begins. Look for the, you got to look for the deep holes in, on the canal, the main canal, and that's where they're at, the big main canal. Pitched out a big old piece of meat and with about a hundred pound test line and sat and waited. That's what you do. And they do not have to wait long. I just got a tap. Something's messing with the line. Hasn't acted large enough, but it might be something that's mouthing. Catfish will do that. While the stories of catfish large enough to eat Amazonian children must be verified, our fear of what lurks below is unquestionably real and universal. Mm. In 1975, the blockbuster movie Jaws tapped into this fear, scaring many water lovers inland for good. Everyone was frightened. Children were told to stay out of the water. They couldn't go swimming. The movie is partly based on a real attack that took place in fresh water, not the ocean. In July of 1916, uh, five shark attacks took place off of New Jersey. Three of them occurred in Matawan Creek. Nearly 15 miles upstream from the open ocean and the brackish waters of Matawan Creek, 
12-year-old Lester Stilwell and his 24-year-old would-be rescuer, Watson Stanley Fisher, were killed. There were young boys swimming. Uh, a shark attacked two of the young men. A third boy was injured later that same day in Matawan Creek. Experts believe the attacker was either a bull shark or great white. Odd visitors to a tidal river just 40 feet wide. Shark might have gone up the creek to attempt to find food. Uh, it might have simply wandered into the creek as a matter of, of investigating a local area. The reason these attacks stirred such fear was because they occurred in fresh water, not in the typical hunting grounds of the Atlantic Ocean. Matawan Creek is not the only place that toothy monsters are found. Across the United States, there is a predator some call the freshwater barracuda. I was over here and I was swimming. In the summer of 2004, in a lake near Pine River, Minnesota, about 160 miles from Minneapolis, Blaine Johnson was attacked. And after I started swimming, I came in to the shore and then you could see everything in front of you and I would just walk along the shore just seeing if I could see fish. As he waited, bait fish and small bluegills scattered in front of each step. Little did he know that a giant fish was also watching his every move. They saw it coming. I didn't have any idea, but I know that they just scattered. And usually when something scatters, something's up. If I moved my foot up about like that, then it was almost out of the water. The next thing I know, I just got hit. Next thing I know, I'm practically running on water. It took me about three seconds to get to the dock, and all the noise when I got up, there was blood on both sides of my ankle coming down. Blaine never got a good look at the fish as it attacked from behind. The thrashing enemy churned the water to a murky brown as it held fast to his foot. It happens so quick, and you're not sure what's going on. There's just one thing in your mind, get away. Johnson still has the scar wrapped around his foot as evidence. The teeth mark goes up all the way up into here. Both Johnson and wildlife experts believe the most likely culprit is a native fish, the pike. Its torpedo-like body bursts from the weeds, propelled up to speeds of 30 miles per hour. Its many rows of teeth are like razors, eviscerating its prey, and it attacks just about anything that moves. Always when, I, when we hear about them, it's that it's a piece of a person being dangled in the water, much like you dangle a lure or something else. Roland Sigurdsson is an aquatic specialist with the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources and says attacks on people are rare but do happen. They are an ambush predator, they're looking for movement, and they're attacking something that will fit into their mouth, something that they can swallow. Pike are found across the northern hemisphere, and officially, the largest muskie caught with a rod and tackle was 67 pounds and just over 60 inches. Roughly the same size as the largest saltwater barracuda. The pike also resembles its saltwater brethren in ferocity. The two largest pike are found in Minnesota, where Johnson was attacked. The northern pike with its horizontal patches and the larger muskellunge, or muskie, with its vertical markings. Whatever it was, it was not afraid of them. There was blood. Uh, you know, that's all I know for sure. There was blood and teeth marks. Some of those teeth were, were good size. Maybe it was hungry. Maybe, you know, and just saw ankle and decided, hey, let's go for it. According to Sigurdsson, even a small pike will attack. It was very hungry and it, it took a chance on something it saw dangling in the water and turned out, unfortunately, it was this young man. The pike's aggressive nature seems to have no limits, including attacking its own kind. It is not known whether the smaller pike in this video was attacked for crossing an unknown boundary or if it was an intended meal. It is proof, however, of the ruthless nature of these toothy monsters. When I first saw it, I thought, that's gotta be like a wolf or some, something big.
In October of 1998, these jaws of a dead muskie were found on an island beach in the Chippewa Flowage in Wisconsin, about 300 miles from Green Bay. The Wohler family were vacationing here when they came upon a carcass on the beach. Teeth just seemed so much longer than any other thing I'd ever seen. Just amazed at the size. There was enough of the carcass remaining to identify the monster. Turns out it was a musky jaw. The jaws have been displayed in a case at the Treeland Resort for the last decade. The question is, how big was this specimen? And was it big enough to attack a man? It could be anywhere from a really nice fish that's still probably the fish of a lifetime for a normal fisherman on up to close to or maybe even commensurate with the world record. There may be a way to determine the size. When you look at the, the thickness of, of this jaw and you compare it to the thickness of, of a replica like a 52 would be, you can see that it, it's probably a good inch and a half to two inches wider than the head on a 52. And it's also a good inch and a half to two inches longer from where the hinge is actually on the fish. You know, so this tells me that this is, this is a huge fish. Matt Yurnitich is a wildlife forensic reconstructionist for artistic anglers in Duluth, Minnesota. He has mounted many monster muskies in the last 15 years. But nothing compares with this. <laughs> it's, it's truly a monster fish. I don't think I've ever seen a fish this big. Look how big his teeth are. <laughs> that would leave a mark. Imagine that swimming around in the lake. Heads are pretty much proportional to the body on, on muskies. Well, if you make the head bigger, you've got to make the body bigger. It will take approximately six weeks to complete the full body. And the results could be amazing. Wisconsin is not the only place in North America with giant fish. According to this man, the cold, clear waters of the Arctic Circle hide something. A lot of fishermen don't believe it, but I was there. He had an encounter with a fish as big as his 14-foot boat. I battled uh, 40, 50 pound fish and uh, this thing made them look like a, a, a minnow. In July of 1987, Jim Peterson was enjoying the solitude in the land of the midnight sun. We were trolling in uh, probably 50 or 60 feet of water. All of a sudden we had this hit. Look at, look at this, I got, a, I got a bite on here. I said, that's a big fish. He's staying out there too. Yeah, he's hanging out there. Little did I know we'd be sitting there for six and a half hours. Wow, will this rod hold it? The fish would take off and then he would stop. I'd start the engine up, drive towards the fish so the fisherman could keep his line tight, get him vertical in the water so we could pump him. It was in around midnight, we could hear the rod starting to crack from the stress. We kept doing the same thing hour after hour after hour. And I, I just was going through my mind that this, this definitely is a new world record. So it was about uh, two, two o'clock in the morning and I thought to myself, what do I do? Do we get out on shore and pull them, try to get them over into the shallow water? Peterson is finally able to pull the fish close enough to the boat. According to Peterson, it was about 14 feet long, as large as his boat. This is when disaster struck. About 2.15 in the morning, the rod started to crack even more. About 15 minutes later, the rod shattered in four pieces, uh -huh. and the line snapped, oh, and the fish was gone. Peterson never got the fish to the surface, but the general shape and coloring points to the lake's top predator, the lake trout. Lake trout have vice-like jaws, keen eyesight, and are considered one of the strongest fighting fish around. 
The largest lake trout caught with a rod weighed in at just over 72 pounds and measured 59 inches, but there have been reports of 120 pound specimen. I have no doubt that it was a, a, a monster lake trout. Wildlife author and biologist Dick Sternberg has come to Point Lake to search with Peterson for the monster. Morning, Dick. Welcome to Hi, Point Dick. Lake. How nice are you? Nice to meet you. Point Lake is located approximately 215 miles north of Yellowknife, the capital of the Northwest Territories of Canada, bordering the edge of the Barren Lands and Arctic Circle. The area is accessible only by float plane. Oh, there's, there's a certain mystique about lake trout. They're down in that deep, dark water where, you know, they're swimming around in the rocks and in the crevices. And uh, I know they can live 50 years, and, uh, and they're probably, you, you know, you hear stories of, the, of them living longer than that. Sternberg is skeptical of many monster fish stories. But if there is a lake with a monster trout, Point Lake is a good place to search. Well, it's uh, 71 miles long. Uh, it's never been commercially fished, never been sports fished. According to Sternberg, one of the reasons people do not catch monsters is because they are not using the proper bait. Catching a giant fish requires giant bait. Uh, you talk about a fish that eats a, a, a 25 or maybe even a 30 inch prey fish. He doesn't have to feed all the time, he just feeds once in a while. Months before, Sternberg set foot on a float plane for Point Lake. He designed two one-of-a-kind lures to help test his theory. Hey, Brad. Oh, hey, Dick. Brad Peterson of Waterworks Fishing Accessories, a division of Metro Molded Parts in Minneapolis, has been creating lures for sport fishermen for decades, but never anything on the scale of what Sternberg has in mind. Uh, I want to make one that looks like a minnow bait. Okay. Big enough to put a camera inside of it. One other one I would want would be like a giant curly tail. Okay. You think you can do that? Oh yeah, we can do that, sure. It's, it's about 20 inches right now. 20, I'd like to see it at 24 inches. Let's make it bigger. Yeah, we're just gonna get this probe going right now. Yeah, it looks pretty good. Lee Dick is what we come up with. Wow. Boy, that looks great. Yeah, I think it's going to work good. We got a camera in the front. That should have a nice wobble to it, too, with that lip. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that looks just like a real minnow bait, doesn't it? It's just a bigger one. Yeah, I like that color, too. In fact, I've got some lures that are exactly that color. They'll begin their search from the Peterson's Point Lake camp. Uh, the camp is right here in the West End, and uh, what I'd like to do is travel about uh, four or five miles down into this uh, deep bay in here. Uh, there's uh, big deep holes in there, and I've been in there before, and there's been some uh, pretty uh, big trout taken out of there. Their first search point is a rock outcrop near where Jim Peterson had his encounter in 1987. The minnow camera lure will be deployed first. Well, what I'm trying to do is use the downrigger as a weight to get the to get this camera lure down to the right depth, and, and then we'll pull it along with the downrigger, keep it at the depth we want it. What do we got for depth, Jim? Thirty-six feet. Well, I can see a little bit. Yep, I'm starting to see a little something now. So it takes about 47 feet to get down 29 feet, in other words. Chances are, if there's a really big fish around, he might come up and at least take a look at it. I mean, it looks like the kind of place you could see some big fish. Like any good fisherman, Sternberg knows you might need to try many different depths and presentations to attract the fish. So who knows? We'll just run it a little bit here and see what happens. No luck so far with the giant minnow lure. But Sternberg is anxious to try the curly lure. They launch the lure, but notice there's a problem with the design. The tail is obscuring the camera. What do you got it at? 31, 37 to the bottom. Seeing the tail wiggling, not seeing the bottom. 
I'm going to trim the tail a little bit and move it. Now let's try that. See if that makes a difference. After a couple of quick adjustments, the lure is back in the water. I've got the camera so it's below the tail now, so the tail is kind of high up in the frame. Yep, I can see it. Yeah, it looks really good. It helped to shorten that tail up a little bit. All we need is a monster fish. Dick Sternberg and Jim Peterson are looking for a monster trout in the cold, clear waters of northern Canada. While their search is based on Peterson's unverified story, there is another giant fish whose behavior and size is better documented. They're just a big, toothy, nasty-looking critter. The alligator gar weighing in at over 350 pounds and over 12 feet long. This prehistoric looking monster is an aggressive, solitary fish. It gets its name from its appearance, with its long snout and two rows of teeth used to pierce and hold its prey. It resembles the alligator in both appearance and ferocity. It feeds by lurking amongst reeds and other underwater plant life, waiting for food to pass by. Its range is throughout the southern United States. You know, they'll eat anything, and they can catch anything. One tale from the early 1900s recounts a fight with an alligator five feet long. The gar succeeded in devouring the gator after cutting him into two pieces with its powerful jaws. There's very few places you can go anywhere that you can, you're, you know, you're liable to catch a fish bigger than you. And, and this is one of them, you know, here in Texas. For 15 years, Kirk Kirkland has run an alligator gar guide service out of Dallas, Texas. Fish are going to be from about seven to eight and a half foot long, with lots of the 100 to 150 pound fish. Officially, the largest alligator gar caught on tackle was 279 pounds and seven and a half feet long, as large as a male bull shark. But long before record keeping, fishermen caught monsters like this 10-footer in 1910 where alligator gar set themselves apart from other gars are by the teeth. An alligator gar has two rows of teeth. Um, the teeth will be from just real little small teeth up to teeth maybe almost as big as a pencil. So uh, and they have uh, their front jaw actually overhangs their bottom jaw, and they have like six teeth that hang out this, out of their mouth. So even if their mouth's closed, they can still get you. I've had uh, people bit. I've had people uh, hit by them with their head. Uh, I've had people cut pretty bad with their teeth. The Trinity River, located about 60 miles southeast of Dallas, will be the location of this Monster Quest effort to videotape and catch a giant-sized gar. It's well over 600 miles long. It's really narrow and winding up in this area. It has one of the best population to alligator gar anywhere in the world. Kirkland uses heavy-duty rods and reels typically seen in deep saltwater fishing. He also uses multiple bait alarms so he can have more than one line in the water at any time. This is a bait runner uh, on this rod and that you set it in the alarm and it, the line will come off of it automatically when the fish start taking it. And as it goes through the alarm, it'll make a beeping noise. With the bait alarms in place, all that remained is for a guard to strike. Kirk is guiding fisherman and Monster Quest videographer Jared Christie. It is Christie's first time fishing for alligator guard. You have no idea how big the fish is going to be, you know, you don't know if it's going to be uh, 10 pounds or 200 pounds. They do not have to wait long. We got a fish uh, just went off. Just taking the bait and running. She may chew on it for 10 minutes, you know, and just keep working it back, getting it further back so she can take the bait. Yeah, we're just right behind it, just following it. So it doesn't even know we're here. A few moments later, it is time to set the hook. I'm going to let you get on slack and start reeling, start reeling. Start reeling. Come on. Hit him again. There you go. Now, really, man. You got him now. Pump down on him. Raise him back up. 
jump again, put some pressure on him. That is an alligator guard. Let's get him on this side of the boat, and I'm going to put this noose around him. Back up. I'm going to stop him about right there. Don't push it Whoa. Wow, that was close. <laughs> Look here. He just about got me. And there, we're going to be in trouble. Go down with him. Here she comes. No! The real danger begins once the fish is in the boat. The gar thrashes wildly its teeth just inches from their legs. Definitely want to stay clear of them. They will bite you, you know, and, and they're, they're pretty nasty when they get in the boat by slinging their head. Eventually, the gar settles down long enough Got it. to get yep. the length and Let's weight of the fish. That's a, you know, a typical fish. You know, uh, we get a lot of these fish over 100 pounds like this. This fish is, uh, you're probably looking at a 30 or 40 year old fish. At 79 inches long and 111 pounds, this gar may not be the largest, but it is a catch of a lifetime for Christy. When that fish actually looks like it's going to come in the boat and you get it in the boat and then it starts flopping around and flying around, that's when you get a real good look at the teeth, the size, the girth, the length. You're, you're, you're standing back just a little bit. <laughs> you're standing back just a little bit until that fish comes down. And, and that's why they get people, you know, they have their mouth open like that when they come up and they're thrashing and, and they, those teeth just hammer you. And, uh, so. <laughs> Just part of the, the allure of catching one, you know. So <laughs> you might come back with all your fingers and toes, and you might not. So. And then we'll give her a little push. She'll know she's going. And there she goes. The largest freshwater giant is still the catfish at over 600 pounds. This monster is king. Mike Nee and Brian Cobb been fishing the Rio Negro River, a tributary of the Amazon, and so far caught nothing of any size. Their quarry is a monster red-tailed catfish. They are on their third and final oh. day. I just got a tap. Something's messing with the line. It hasn't acted large enough, but it might be something that's mouthing. Catfish will do that. They fished a number of deep water holes known for big catfish, but caught nothing larger than 20 pounds, just a baby compared to the legends. Catfishing this afternoon has uh, highly disappointed me. I was really expecting a monster fish. We're just in the wrong spot. Their search for a monster catfish is over. Definitely wanted to catch a catfish. Yeah, but there'll be another time. In the old days, you would see a lot more of these here, the big ones. Now you got more people here being fished out, but there's still some big ones in the rivers. Halfway around the world, Dick Sternberg and Jim Peterson are in the Arctic Circle hunting giant trout. They too are in their last day with one last lure to try. You know, we've been trying a lot of different methods here to try to get some of these big trout on film. And uh, haven't had a whole lot of success so far, but we got another idea here. We're going to keep trying. While Sternberg continues his search, proof of a giant muskie in Wisconsin has been found. The forensic reconstruction is complete, and the results are surprising. The ocean is famous for its toothy monsters, but if fish stories are to be believed, freshwater lakes and rivers around the world may also be home to dangerous giants. This family found the jaws of what they believe is a record-breaking pike. She was there when a cousin was knocked from his canoe to be devoured by a monster catfish. And this expert believes you need to use giant bait to catch giant fish.
Wildlife biologist Dick Sternberg is in the last day of his search for a monster trout. There's a big deep holes in there and I've been in there before. And there's been... Jim Peterson has brought them to one of his hotspots. Well, here we are, Dick. We're in that spot I was telling you about, so we'll uh, we'll get ready and uh, drop a line over and see what happens. Well, the first thing, Jim, I guess we get our uh, minnow bait with the camera into the water. Yeah, she looks like she's going down pretty good. Yep. Okay, slow her down a little bit. Keep her pretty pretty slow. All right. It's 44 feet right here, Dick. Hopefully one of these uh, monster lake trout will come up and take a look at it. Sternberg says trout continue to grow throughout their lives. So big fish are likely old fish. And this area has just the right conditions. The lack of commercial or sport fishing, the abundance of food, and the cold, clean waters mean lake trout likely do live longer here. If he can capture proof of a six-foot-long trout, then new light may be shed on the many credible fish stories. Another one right yeah, there. Yeah, well, there's another a, one. Oh, there's a bunch of them. Yeah. Peterson's depth finder shows schools of fish, but nothing significant comes up on the minnow lure. We'll try yeah. it again after a while, but I think I got a couple other ideas, some other things we might want to try here. Sure. Taped our, our camera to a, I guess this is called a halibut rig. It's a big chunk of wire, uh, and uh, we got the fin here so it'll track straight in the water and we're going to put a uh, uh, a Cisco on this hook right here and the camera will be pointing right at it drop this thing in and see what we, yeah. we can see with it that looks good I can see the I can see the Cisco I can see the bottom it looks like the kind of spot where one of those big guys ought to live they do get good video of lake trout in the 20 to 30 pound range, but nothing like they were hoping for. Well, we ran that thing for a while, Jim, and uh, didn't see anything. Their attempts to capture a monster lake trout on video prove unsuccessful. Sternberg believes the monsters do exist, but finding them isn't easy. We know they're out there, uh, but you look at a lake of this size and, and you, you know, you you got 75 miles of water, whatever it is here, and, and 300 feet deep. And uh, we probably scratched about a 1% of the <laughs> area, you know. And what about the pike jaws found in northern Wisconsin in 1998? Did they come from the largest pike ever recorded? Matt Yurnatich's reconstruction is finished. We made the world record muskie at one time, uh, and it was similar in size to what this was. And we did that from measurements we were given at the time. This one just was just a, a hair on the, on the bigger side. If your Natich's estimates are correct, these jaws came from a muskie that was just over six feet long and roughly 70 pounds, over twice the size of the pike that attacked Blaine Johnson in 2005 and likely larger than the world record muskie. It is hard to know whether many stories of monster-sized fish are real or fabricated. History says giant fish did exist, but their numbers have been depleted over the recent decades because of overfishing and pollution. Yet, big fish tales continue. According to experts, fear drives many stories and the success of movies like Jaws. People were frightened, and uh, that, that tenure, that feeling, remained in the area for many, many months. Our freshwater lakes and rivers are safe for the most part, but occasionally a real monster is lurking and waiting to be discovered, just like the monster pike found in the waters of Wisconsin.